thank you very much for uh, risking coming here to listen to my to my talk. And some of you heard me talking about this before. Uh, I don't think there will be any major additions. But anyway, thank you very much for giving me an occasion uh, to talk about something that uh, we currently do at York University Computer Museum at York. And thanks for uh, inviting me here. Now, <laughs> wait until the end. Uh, <laughs> you, you may want to take it back. Uh, digital archaeology, uh, sort of a provocation on my part, is yes, something like that does exist. There is a term. Um, and uh, yes, there will be a connection. This is not exactly what I will be doing and talking about. <laughs> However, I will take uh, advantage of uh, some analogies between these nice clay tablets with Sumerian writing and uh, what I really want to talk about, and that's uh, recovery of data from media that you have no idea about. I mean, imagine a scenario where you know that storage media contains something very significant, and I will try to justify, um, oh, I have to say hi to camera as well. The, but the digital media contains something significant, but all the technical information is gone. And by rough inspection of media, you know that it, 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 it's a very unique. The way that information uh, was stored, from a sort of logical and uh, technical organization of data on the storage media is very unique, non-standard, and you really have no clue what to go And so it reminds me of, uh, of real uh, digital archaeology. And, well, in the case of Sumerian tablets, the story is um, that in mid-19th century, actually, people managed to decipher Sumerian writing. and. We are now in uh, ah. ah, this is this is uh, let me let me uh, pause for a moment. So digital digital archaeology is defined uh, is basically using computational tools to do classical archaeology. So classify, dig in data, build models, and uh, and predict what 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 did happen. So, but this is not exactly what I want to do. I want to extend that to actually digging through different kind of junk, not clay vases and, uh, and jewelry, but uh, storage media. Right. So yeah, I will use an analogy with Italian, so let me introduce you to that a little bit. Um, Sumerians, uh, yes, they started to recording information on, on clay media. Uh, and uh, luckily, we can read it, so there is no problem with uh, what these tablets contain. The issue is different, uh, namely there are so many of them. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of these clay tablets, only some of them, even right now, um, have been read. And uh, the reason is, not too many experts. I tried to learn the language. Uh, everything is available, including pronunciation, not only grammar, but pronunciation as well. You can be really an expert. But what one can do right now, and this is partly done already, uh, somehow it's very slowly. So let me try it again. OK. To do one. No, I'm just saying it looks like, for some reason, it looks like you have to hit it. Yeah, yeah, this is, this is what I realize right now. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea right now is, yeah, you have a few experts, but still you can do, you can put your clay tablet to a drive, and you have uh, a translation in English. Um, can you do that? Yes, but uh, this is, this is, <coughs> oh, the twice. This is available, and, and here it is. Uh, that's a, a little bit of photoshopping. So it's a real tablet that I did the first row. And if you translate that, it will be to be or not to be, that's the question. 
<laughs> Samarian. Yeah. So they wrote him. Oh yeah, so the original. <laughs> no, it's not only when when you read these tablets. Actually, uh, it, it, it's just fascinating. The first poetry is there, and all the uh, sort of biblical uh, stories like the flood and so on. Uh, it, it's recorded uh, five thousand. Uh, BC on these uh, tablets, so you know at least uh, the source of some of these uh, stories and uh, legends. And anyway, uh, what uh, what uh, ideally I would like to do is to uh, to to go through this same process, going back to mid 19th century and take this digital media that I have in mind and decipher and to be able to read it and to get these wonderful stories, these uh, first poetry and. And, and 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 stories that uh, with, the, with the with roots in these ancient cultures, but of course in digital context. Now, so instead of that, what I would like to do is, hit twice, is to take this media. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, some of you may recognize microcomputer machines. It was a Toronto-based company, but. Uh, designed and manufactured uh, a computer that can be considered the first PC, the first microprocessor powered computer for personal use in 1973. So the announcement was in 1973, in 1974, they started to sell it. Now, so here's the analogy. This is another tablet, the clay tablet. This time, uh, it's a proto uh language which we cannot read. There is definitely a lot of structure. I just copied some of the arrangements of dots. So there is some information there, no clue what it means. Now, what I'm interested in are these tapes. So in 2016, so last year, uh, our museum obtained, uh, yeah, we have uh, these MCM computers, including the first one, and that computer used magnetic tapes, really audio cassette, cassettes uh, with uh, special notch to make sure that you are recording on the right side, uh, on the, uh, the right side. So we've got these, because our, and, and we're very happy because uh, our computers have no, almost no software. So yeah, we at some point will receive uh, MCM machines, including the first one, MCM 70, nothing to uh, run. And indeed, the software in 2016 was very scarce. Now, why software is important? Because if one ag agrees with me that MCM70, that you will see in a moment, was the first PC de designed specifically for personal use, what you should have on these tapes are examples of the first personal software, software for us. And this is what I really wanted to see. I wanted to see, you know, MCM by sort of, not exactly inventing personal computer, but being the, one of the first in personal computing business, when personal computing was not even an academic term, <coughs> they had to invent many things. Like, wh wh what does it mean to create a personal computer? What would people need in terms of personal software? What kind of software? So all of these questions, uh, uh, they were facing all of these questions and problems. These cassettes could answer these questions. What was that person? And who were? What, who, who were the people targeted by MCM? What was the audience? What were, to, what were these first PC users do, uh, uh, be doing with, uh, with these PCs? And so all these secrets, we hoped, would be, would be here on the tapes. Now, <coughs> uh, here are these dots. Um, I ran these tapes <coughs> on an audio cassette, did recording, digital recording. Yeah, and I see these dots here, right? Lots of patterns, uh, a little bit of noise, a little block, big block, again, something, some nice tail, and again, the same little block with break and large block. So I said, well, there is some data there. And there is some arrangement of data, because you see this from the structure. These the segments here. The only thing is to understand it, to read it. Now. This is 1973, four and five, so over 40 years. By some estimates, uh, these cassettes are good for 25 years. So what is the chance that you still have anything uh, which is not corrupted 
uh, to a degree that you will not be able to extract any, any information from, from these tapes. Okay, before I answer these questions, so again, for those of you who've never heard about microcomputer machines, here's a little corporate history. The, so the company was incorporated in 71 in Toronto. In 73, they announced uh, that MCM 70 in production in 74, and uh, was sold in North America and Europe. And uh, eventually, in 1982, uh, they were history. Like many other companies around the time. Do you have any idea how many units they sold? Uh, MCM 70? Yeah. Uh, I can only, I traced the several of these machines including uh, uh, their numbers, and I would say I have around 250 on the record. Uh, how many were sold? A few thousand. Which again, if you are talking about early 1970s, a few thousand wasn't really too bad, but it was not on the scale that you will see uh, when the say, hobby movement starts seriously in 75, 76. And, uh, and again, this is just the model MCM70. It was 700, 800, 900 power, superpowers. There were other computers. But as far as this one, I would say no more than 1,000 or 2,000. And they were everywhere, including Soviet Academy of Science. It's uh, about 12 of them. Right. Uh, actually, we got lucky this year. Uh, because the MCN 70, when it was shown, again, this is just a digression, when it was shown for the first time in Europe, uh, they showed not the, something that would be a production model, but a prototype. But that prototype was mounted in other shared case, and it was run on batteries. So imagine 1973, hit uh, twice, because I think, okay. That, this is another prototype, but this is this is more or less the, the pre-production model, and the production model looks like I will get back to that. Okay, that's the production model. Now uh, they repackaged that into uh, attaché case, and as I said, run on batteries. So here you have these two cassette drives. They were used for two purposes, of course, to store data, but also for uh, as virtual memory. Virtual memory basic idea, if you run out of RAM, then uh, you use a tape uh, to extend it. That concept was available only on some IBM mainframes, uh, 375, but some when they were designing this. Uh, 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 what you have also is one line uh, plasma display, um, full keyboard, um, built-in APL program language, uh, automatic power failure uh, protection, saving everything that you are doing in case uh, there was a, a power break. Uh, before that, the, the computer automatically switched into battery operations, and when batteries were about to expire, everything was copied. The entire workspace of yours <coughs> was copied to the tapes. And when the power was restored, batteries recharged slightly, everything moved, was moved back to, to RAM, and you were continuing, that's nothing happened, right? So, uh, returning to uh, Europe, so it, it was in Copenhagen, APL conference, and you see this uh, computer in other case. Here you have these APL gurus, and in 73, APL was a religion in many places, most of the corporations. Uh, the, the most of the corporations uh, manufacturing the mainframes. Um, and suddenly there is a guy sitting on the doorsteps of Polytechnical Institute there uh, doing APL. Uh, and so the reaction was, is this really for real? And, but but it's interesting that the first reaction was just to find a power cable. The, the, actually, what was not believable was that you can uh, operate uh, this on batteries. Um, and that was, of course, the era of uh, handheld calculators. Uh, something that you had with you all the time, operated on batteries, was a, was a, was a new trend. Anyway, so these are these, 
so, so as I said, these cassettes were also used for, for storing data, and this is what I meant is the DIN. So suddenly, oh, I know why I was talking about uh, telling you about that. Anecdote. So there is a nice photograph in a Danish newspaper, Politiken, uh, with a first page uh, caption, uh, a sensational computer from Canada. And, and then uh, nobody saw that prototype in Natasha case. So we got lucky because this year, I've got an email, you know, in my basement, there's that uh, computer that my father uh, was using to, uh, to demonstrate MCM7 to, in Denmark, would you like to have it? So, yeah, we do have it. And you have the newspaper article. The yes, yes, of yes. All right, so this is a fake when I'm telling the story about MCM. Uh, I, I try to, I, I try people to visualize um, a computer show uh, or some other event when manufacturers would be demonstrating hardware and MCM was demonstrating its computer in, in, in many during many events. So uh, imagine, uh, imagine people seeing a mainframe uh, and then uh, next day, well, there will be MCM with that little thing saying, do you know, yeah, you can do APL here or you can do APL here. This one. So I think that uh, to see, uh, to show IBM executives uh, switching to MCM from this beautiful hardware. All right. So I told you everything, almost everything. So the first microprocessor powered PC 8008, uh, used Intel 8008, APL built in, and so on and so on. Uh, but let's move to the tapes. Well, significance, uh, eventually MCM, as I said, collapsed in 82. It was never a major force. It could be, but there were many reasons that I don't want to discuss here. It's not the subject. Uh, but <laughs> there, is, there are these firsts, like personal software, like the concept of personal user. Who were these people supposed to be? And the secrets were we hoped in, uh, on, on all these tapes. And uh, if... Uh, I don't have any interesting to say at the end about these days. Of course, there will be no talk. And so the significance comes from what actually what we found on the, on the tape. So let's get back to the main uh, stream. Yeah, so I mentioned Gord Raymer was actually running the software show. Uh, it's interesting, Gord Raymer was working, uh, before joining MCM, he was working at York University. And he is the author of the so-called York APL, if you were ever into APL, and especially, especially in Toronto. So uh, there is a nice York connection with the project. But again, uh, let's move forward. Uh, I mentioned uh, the, uh, the, uh, the issue that uh, these tapes, I should really bring one, um, were old, dusty, and there was no guarantee that there is anything readable. Uh, and however, what was encouraging is that when we put that on that audio player, there was definitely a, a significant signal. It was a very strong signal coming up. So that was the good news. Now, we, st we will have a working <coughs> MCM70 because this is one of the uh, projects at our museum. But at that time, we didn't. And I didn't really want to uh, risk um, burning anything by, by, by trying uh, to use any of these MCM services in an unsafe way to try to read these tapes. And um, furthermore, um, if you were to read these tapes through existing MCM hardware, you would never see things that were sort of software erased, things that you're not supposed to see, uh, they were still sitting on the table. So yes, we've got some uh, tapes that were apparently empty, nothing on them. But when you, eventually when we were ready to read them, yes, there was plenty of information. So uh, reading using original, uh, original hardware was not really an issue. Um, so what do you do instead? Well, we decided to, well, I'm talking about something which is different on slides. I will get to that. 
So in the end, we decided to reconstruct, rebuild enough MCM70 to be able to read these tapes. So the, uh, the, 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 the tape drives, or the, 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 uh, enough of that uh, hardware to, uh, to safely put the tapes on and, and possibly read uh, the tapes from that. I'm not an expert on hardware design. Fortunately, um, some of our volunteers that I mentioned at the end do have that uh, expertise. They are brilliant vintage hardware engineers, and they managed to, one person, Josh in particular, managed to actually build uh, such a uh, test box jig. And yeah, and I will get to that, what happened next. Uh, but the, the problem is, the problem was in 2016 when we started the project that uh, by looking at audio recordings, you knew right away that uh, you are talking about non standard way of uh, organizing data on tapes. And <coughs> we knew that, well, our museum has the largest uh, uh, collection of uh, MCM70 objects, manuals, and hardware, and so on and so on. There is nothing technical on it that will help you to figure out what was the lo logical organization of data, what was the physical organization of data on tapes, whether there was any encoding, if it were, what, and... So, yeah, if we were to continue with the project, then the only thing was just to talk to the engineers. And, you know, some of them did remember bits and pieces of it, and some of them did not. But at least there were hints. Try this, try that, try that. In many cases, it did not work. It was not exactly like that. So I showed you little blocks and big blocks. So one of the people said, well, yeah, yeah, I know. We, what we organized, this big block was 128 bytes, and it was a data. No, it wasn't. Yeah, it was 128, but it wasn't data. There was a lot of metadata in front, in the middle, at the end, um, and real data, which is a little fragment. So yeah, but they were good hints. Right. So that's uh, what I'm talking about, starting from nothing. Uh, I did that. So I talked about a preview, right? So that's a general uh, uh, overview of signals. And if you magnify this, you can see definitely uh, bits coming. And here they are. Uh, and Again, where are these zeros and ones on the raising um, the signal, on the on, on dying signal? Where, 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 and we can't, uh, do you see any 8-bit blocks? Uh, no, we can't. You count all these bits, and they are not multiples of 8. There are looks, they look like multiple of 9, so maybe the ninth bit was a parity or something. Anyway, anyway, everything was about guessing and guessing. But in the end, as I said, we. Uh, we built a jig, uh, and we tested it on, uh, obviously, on modern cassettes. We didn't want to put any MCM cassettes uh, before we, uh, we knew that it's safe. And uh, yeah, managed to read and write at the end. Now, reading and writing uh, is a complicated business because we figured that one side of the tape, there are two tracks, one track, uh, was data track, and another one was the clock uh, track. And the purpose of the clock was to make sure that the tape uh, is moving with, uh, with, a, with an even speed. So that, that ha had to be discovered, and what's the speed, and so on and so on. Uh, then we could read and write. So the time was just to put the real tape. And it didn't work. <laughs> so we placed another tape. It didn't work. Uh, well, that was interesting because you can read it on audio cassette. So we said, okay, and if we were, if the worst case, we'll be using these audio images and try to work with that rather than uh, directly grabbing these bits and interpreting them. Uh, no. <laughs> so there were lots of uh, hypotheses what could go wrong, and uh, maybe uh, the tape drive mechanism was the 
uh, the different one uh, from the original uh, use for recording. But in the end, it was just a very, very banal thing. Namely, uh, after 25 years, the magnetic material is intact. It, it was still intact. Nothing really happened to it. However, the packaging <laughs> went wrong. It went bad. And I wish I had a blackboard. Um, just a little detail, just uh, a little anecdote. So, all right. Um, and I have to write with my blood? No. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> So here's the tape, that's the head, and there is a little sponge here, which guarantees that the tape presses well mm -hmm. against the head. Now, after so many years, that sponge became a rock, <laughs> and it didn't work. After repackaging, miracle, we see the bits and bites coming, or bits. So that was very, very silly. Yeah, there was a lot of repackaging, and, uh, but it worked in the end. So maybe out of these 30 plus tapes, one was not readable, one was really bad. All the other ones uh, were read without really any significant problems. So I mentioned that. So in the end, over two megabytes of uh, information have been, have been recovered. Uh, two megabytes, is this a lot? Well, an average program was 4K, 3K, so we're talking really about a lot of programs. But, so that's the first stage, yeah? that was in a sense easy. So we have all the bits, but what do they mean? How to group them into bytes? What are these extras? And yes, what we've discovered that indeed, um, the data was organized in such a way that you had a little block, that was your metadata, everything about what will follow, then a little bit space and the big data. Big data again uh, had its own structure. Uh, and all of that has to be had to be uh, uh, deciphered in order to actually to get some information. Which again, step by step, step by step. So yes, we figure out, yes, you have to group things into uh, nine bit bytes and, and, and that gets, gets, you, get, gets you information and then you have to learn about metadata. And you see there was a lot of metadata stored for one reason. Uh, well, uh, there were probably many reasons, but one, uh, the main one was that 8008 was a very, very slow CPU. And it could address on the 16K of memory, right? APL was memory hungry. You really had to have a lot of memory, 30, 40K of memory at least. So some of that could be dealt by, with by sort of uh, paging, and another using uh, the tape for virtual memory. Uh, but anyway, so having a small amount of uh, memory and having a low speed, uh, you could not afford to do a lot of things in RAM. So when, 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 when your program was stored, it was stored with a lot of pre-computed data. So that when we, you were bringing that uh, program back, a lot of things had already done. So just one example, a APL uh, 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 typically is an interpreter. So all the lines were stored, again, when we, we finally started to read the APL code, everything was just in opposite order. And I, I was just uh, asking, why is the APL line um, uh, stored from right to left, rather from, you know, from left to right? But this is how APL is being executed. You, your main <laughs> functions of right inside is post order. Uh, Executions, all the operations are, uh, are still there. So, so in a sense, everything was already prepared for execution. All the extra tables, all the ex uh, any extra that you needed for execution will be will be there. The length of lines, the number of operators on the line, everything was pre-computed and stored nicely. So, yes, these data blocks were 128 bytes long, 
but after that, a substantial amount were metadata. Now, it took, it took really months to decipher all of that. <coughs> yeah, so as I said, we were getting something like that out of the tapes. So one block will have 128 of these, plus some checksums, plus uh, uh, other things uh, in, in metadata. And, uh, and again, uh, trying to understand what it is uh, took us some time. And fortunately, we knew that this was an APL machine, so what you have on tapes, other than you know, directories for, for storing information about, uh, uh, there were no files, there were groups, APL calls, all the stuff that you are packing into the same space, a group. So yeah, there were group directories and other directories, um, but uh, most of what you have on these tapes in terms of objects, these were functions, APL functions, and data. So this is, this is what you do and this is what you could uh, search for. Right, so let's get, uh, let's, uh, much later, very good. So what we found eventually, after all of that, extracting bits, uh, converting to bytes, and eventually uh, making sense of all of that, uh, lots of interesting stuff. Corporate information, who was working, how much they were paid, what were problems, what were the development plans. So interesting things. They were planning to build in 74 incredible hardware. And then on another tape, there would be another uh, man managerial meeting in which they would drop that project and the reason for it. So there is a lot of historical information about the corporation itself, Finan fi financial stuff. Uh, all sorts of uh, <coughs> report generation. Uh, software. Uh, report for sales, report for this, report for that. Uh, for internal but also for external use. Uh, so a lot of uh, that material, these reporting forms were for uh, MCM distributors. This is how MCM was selling their hardware through distributors. Software developed for corporate clients. Interesting software. Uh, for instance, how to translate all your stuff uh, from punch cards into some uh, magnetic uh, uh, digital media. So they, 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 there were programs written for, for, for several corporations to convert their data from tapes and, and punch cards into, uh, and to put them on disks. So with, uh, the, with the MCM 70, would, you, would it basically be to have yeah, a bunch of punch cards and we're gonna encode them onto a cassette? and then the cassette can read back to load the data into a oh, they, 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 uh, they, they, they manufactured a peripheral, which was the punch card reader, and with that, an MCM, and software, you would be able to convert that to audio cassette. That's right. Or to, pretty soon, in 74, 75, mm -hmm. uh, they, you could connect that box to, uh, uh, to a disk drive. Half a meg and then a meg uh, of hard drive. Uh, so you could get that on, on the link as well. But that's not the end, uh, because what I was personally interested in was, a, was personal software. And there are quite a few tapes uh, we, we, which were signed. So that tape belongs to such and such a guy. So you knew that what he was collecting was personal software. I'm telling him because there were no women uh, developing anything in MCM at that time. So there were personal software collected by some of the employees. And we had these tapes, including one uh, named after the uh, second president of MCM. So we have a tape of stuff collected by him. So that was interesting, what's there. Then enhancement of existing MCM operating system, yeah, because it had tape utilities and so on and so on. And these libraries of personal software a uh, text editor. So MCM produced the first text editor for uh, for a microcomputer. Home financing, computer art, computer games. Well, again, again yeah, computer games were, of course, before MCM, but since uh, if you accept that MCM was one of the first uh, PCs, but what you played on MCM were the first PC games. And, uh, 
and indeed this was the case. You can imagine her with just one line plasma display, what kind of game that uh, that was. So. And anyway, um, I will I will I will let you a little bit uh, more information about that. So. This actually, when we eventually build software that takes um, sort of a CAT scan of tapes and produces uh, the content in a human readable form, that's what we will see. So that's a part of APO code. That's a, it's just basically a text. So this is a little promo uh, from, I think, 74 or 75. So yeah, this is the MCM70 desktop computer with features normally found in large computer systems. So I'm going to, again, 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 right? Um, <laughs> right. I guess you would print that out, right? You wouldn't just look at that one line at a time? <laughs> well, you could, uh, you could connect MCM70 to a printer. Uh, but an interesting thing is this actually, uh, this image, uh, uh, of course, it's uh, Playboy started it, right? And, and that type of art was eventually everywhere. But <laughs> it came in uh, as two files, and so, so you had to run two programs. One was printing stuff, and then the second was printing the bottom part of the, of the, of the image. And I had these two, and I, I looked at this, and I said, well, what, kind of, what, what, what is this? What is this? So I just ignored it uh, until later, when, uh, when actually, uh, yeah, the software that we have, it just takes that tape, reads it, and produces the entire content in human readable form. Now, these two came one after another, and they said, oh my god, yeah, I know what it is. Um, but, yeah, I will return to that, because that, that, that actual image helps to uh, speculate a little bit about um, the first generation of, of users. So. One of the most interesting things for me was actually the concept of a personal computer user and how that evolved over the years. Because the tapes cover the period between 74 and 78. And it's interesting to see how that concept of the user, PC user, was changing. So, first of all, from the very beginning, uh, uh, M uh, MCM was, uh, was selling MCM 70s as something that is for you, for your personal use. Welcome to computer age. Uh, you have your personal computer at home and things like that. So it's explicitly stated that what they wanted to do is a computer for a person. Although, you know, uh, there was one issue, they were still expensive. Yeah, there were $4,000 machines in basic configuration. In 73, 74, that bought you uh, two Ford Mustangs, convertibles with radio and uh, mirrors included. So that was not exactly for everybody's pocket, but anyway. So uh, at the beginning, when they, when they started to manufacture MCN 70s, they basically followed the footsteps of, uh, of, a, of large boys in the industry, in which a, a hardware uh, company would just produce the hardware with, soft, with a little bit of system software, and then uh, everything is up to you. Write your own application programs, hire someone to do that. Uh, although software industry started in 65, 66, but still it was a predominant uh, approach to uh, application software. That's not us. You arrange your own software. So be your own program. That was, that was the slogan. And let me show you how easy it is to program an APL. In half an hour, you will be an excellent APL programmer. That was the slow. Yeah. <laughs> now, an interesting one, when, again, one surprising thing uh, coming out of these tips is, well, as I mentioned, uh, MCM was not a major play on, on, on PC market. But what happened to MCM, is, uh, to MCM and MCM7 in particular uh, was, um, was something that eventually the entire PC industry and home computer industry went through. So if you recall, hobby movement, how did it start? Be your own program, right? You have your 256 bits, uh, bytes of, 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 of RAM in Altair, and write something interesting, yes? Uh, what about home industry, uh, home computer industry? Home computer industry, 77? 
Programming in basic is easy. Let me show you how it is, how, how easy it is. And then eventually, uh, you, you will see the evolution. Yeah, maybe not everyone wants to write his or her own text editor. Maybe certain things have to be uh, given to you. Maybe you are not exactly interested in uh, all the inner workings of, of APL. Maybe you would like to be just a software consumer. No. For MCM, it was never something that they would officially, uh, uh, unofficially agree to, but uh, eventually they were forced to accept the reality. So what happened to MCM was, um, uh, 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 was an indication of what will happen to PC and com computer industry. That's, that's interesting. And actually, this is what happened not only here in North America, but if you look at uh, uh, home and personal computing development, say, in Japan or in Asia, or in former Soviet Union that they did research on, Exactly the same thing, but a decade later. So, so it's it, it's interesting uh, indeed to uh, right. So in seven seventy five, there is an in, in interesting uh, uh, turn of events. Still, MCM thinks that PC users should be um, their uh, programmers as well. And actually, I remember that. Uh, um, the narrative, educational computing narrative at the end of 1970s was that an intelligent and educated individual should know at least two programming languages. That was the that was, uh, assumption. But anyway, the interesting twist is that suddenly MCM says, well, a PC user should be a connected user. Yes, you have to take care of your own programs, but we don't mind if you find these programs somewhere else. So where is it somewhere else? Well, there are a lot of services, computing services, Comshare, IP Sharp Network, University of Toronto was running the services, their own uh, uh, network with lots of APL stuff on it. So suddenly, uh, MCN produces a lot of software and hardware support for people to be connected. So something that we are taking for granted right now, but it was a very unique feature at that time. I think it's, again, the earliest, the the earliest. So now PC user is a network PC owner, end user, and still personal software developer. But you go later, 1976 and 77, beginning of home, com uh, home computing, and you will see another turn of event, and this is what you see through the type of software that we're finding. Uh, so now you will see the acknowledgement that uh, there is a huge market. There is a huge population of potential clients, MCM clients, provided that there will be a ready software for them. So they started. They started with Tech 70. So this is the first text editor for MCM 70. Then you have uh, Text 700 for a little upgrade to MCM 70, and so on and so on. You see some financial, really commercial financial programs to do exactly that private machine, and you can do your spreadsheets. Yes, they had spreadsheets before Visical. This APL provides you with almost everything <coughs> that you need. And the first spreadsheet, I think, was written. Maybe I, no. I'm not sure camera whether that was written in APL or not, but uh, so I will not continue with that speculation. So here it is, a beginning of a trend. Yes, there are consumer, software consumers. And actually, I, we found after that, I think uh, through boxes of our MCM collection, and yes, I found a document uh, by one of, the major, one of the managers sent a letter to potential clients, and he says, yes, some of you are not interested in APL, um, so we are producing a ready-to-go software. However, uh, perhaps some of you would like to take a look at the code, so we will include the code. Hint, hint, they wanted uh, clients also to hunt for bugs. And if you want to be sure that our implementation of software has a decent ground, here are the text or the sources which we used for the implementation. So there was a complete package addressed actually to both programmers and for non-programmers. So you see that, that switch. Uh, however, it was not a switch from be your own programmer to software consumer, but they said we will expand the scope. How am I doing? Uh, 
Okay, very good. I'm about done. So, okay, so uh, yes, this bit trend will switch. So, 1977, you have your Apple IIs and, and uh, Pets, and what else appeared in 77? Texas Instrument? Right. And uh, yeah, they appeared, but uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a point of view on a, on a user, a be your own program. There was not really much in terms of uh, uh, decent application software. Yes, there were some games, games were always there, but nothing else. This is the, the time when MCM was already switching or, or expanding into software consumer area. And, and that's what they added here, a, a, a new feature. So if you look at the tapes recorded in 1977, 76, 77, you have a lot of that ready to go, well documented person software. <coughs> and uh, there is one uh, more question that I would like to talk about is who were the target users? How? Uh, so wh who were these guys who were supposed to buy MC accessories? So. First of all, these were not corporations, or not only corporations. And if you look at, uh, there is lots of text. This is actually something found on the tape. So the description of MCM 700, read 70, because this, is, this was really an enhancement. And uh, setting the idea of a user who, who, who is connected. And it's oversaturated with you, for you, and for you, and you will be this, and that, and that, and that. Now. Um, so definitely it, it was addressed to a single individual. But to who? Do you want to know what the selling price was? Yeah, between the, uh, well, depends on the year. But at the beginning it was between four and eight thousand dollars. So it would be like a well skilled male. Right, so this is one thing. Uh, uh, how, how many women would be interested in uh, uh, play ball bunny. It's a definitely male audience as well. So this is why I, I brought that uh, about. Because you see, uh, for where I found this bunny, it was a tape, was a demo tape. So MCM produced a demonstration tape that we, uh, they were distributing to their distributors so that they could show that to their clients. And you see, uh, at that time, 74, 75, you could have Snoopy the dog, and you can have Spock, and you can have all sorts of that digital art, these XX things, but they, go, they, they, they went for, for, for Playboy, right? So that really tells you uh, uh, something about the, uh, the, the, the general uh, understanding who would be most interested, other than the pocket, of course, uh, interested in acquiring a computer. What is the target audience there? Uh, how much else have I found in terms of evidence? Not much. Uh, these these things. It's more of a speculation. Uh, there's supposed to be another demonstration tape, which is not there. This is a bad news. So we have one demonstration tape. There is a, we know that there is another one. So these demonstration tapes will have a little bit of commercial software, a little bit of uh, a, um, a libraries, APL libraries for, for users to to take these functions and uh, build them into their own programs. So it's a mixture of interesting stuff. But I, I told you about this uh, uh, MCM70 prototype and Natasha case. It didn't arrive alone. It, 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 it arrived with another 70 cassettes, which we haven't looked at. That's uh, our January project. So I can't really imagine what 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 what's there. So this is what I told you. So on the basis of thirty tapes, and but we have uh, a lot of more to go. And some of these tapes are really interesting. Not all of them are digital stuff uh, from uh, destined for MCM seventy. Among them, we found four tapes, audio recordings of uh, of a technical meeting that took place at MCM when they were discussing the further development of MCM 70. And this is something like five hour recording of what they were doing, what they were planning to do, and so on and so on. Very, very unusual. 
I don't, I, I, I can't recall any early recording like that concerning, say, the creation of Apple <coughs> One or building Altair 8800 and so on and so on. So it's very, very, very unique, uh, very unique audio recording. So treasures, treasures, and as I said, I can't wait until until January, but uh, I teach at York, and and this term that just ended uh, was a bitch, and I couldn't really <laughs> move a finger. Uh, the next one is a different story, so I can't really wait to take a look at the main tapes. Well, I think that's uh, one more slide. Uh, conclusions, you know, I, I would like to mention Josh, who frequently comes to that mm -hmm. meeting. He was the guy who did the hardware for oh, our recovery. He is really a talented guy. If you have any problems, just call him. <laughs> <laughs> Ask for a price. <laughs> so he built the jig and uh, he discovered that funny thing with the tape, this uh, sponge thing, all his work. Uh, mine was actually to convert all these bits that he was able to extract into uh, a human readable form. So that was, that was a sort of a huge detective story. Anyway, uh, one more thing that I would like to tell you about. Uh, yes, that's uh, our museum work. And we are in the process of mounting a permanent uh, computer history exhibition at York University. Uh, we are in the fundraising and architectural design stage. And if you'd like to have more, in, more information about this project that will deal exclusively with history of computing in Canada, and that includes copy movement, industry, um, social issues, everything, everything. Please let me know. Would you like to cooperate? Would you like to contribute? You would like to know, say, you know someone with deep pocket who can't wait to see <laughs> the initiative? Please let me know. Thank you very much. Most kind.